Despite the post of the Civil War, the actions of all brave men were well documented, but the quiet leadership of all women was forgotten, though it changed the course of our nation forever. As the war progressed, many women took on the jobs of men by tending to the plantation, running the households, or the family businesses. Women in the South also had to take on the work of the slaves who had run away. Or the back. Look in my hand. Mother didn't even always tell a lady about him. I guess things like hands and legs don't matter so much anymore. You win. You are not winning. And I can pick cotton for both of them. Nursing became an important way of life for women to volunteer their time for the cause. At first, it was considered unladylike, but as the casualties rose, the need for this work increased. Limitations on nurses included marital status, age, and attire. Many prominent figures, such as Clara Barton, Florence Nightingale, and Dorothea Dix, emerged during this period. Because women were not allowed to enlist in the military, some disguised themselves as men and served in either the Union or Confederate Army. Since they were disguised, however, it is impossible to know exactly how many women soldiers were fighting in the war. Estimates are around 400. The purpose of these women was commonly to be with their husbands, but many served out of pure patriotism. Women were represented in all three branches of the army, the infantry, cavalry, and artillery. Surprisingly, many of them became sergeants and in some cases officers. They usually held these positions until they were wounded or killed. Some only resigned after the war ended. Many of the enlisted men were very young, so feminine features such as a high voice or beardless face were not indicators of a woman soldier. However, gestures might give a woman away. Mary Smith, who was serving in the 41st Infantry, was disguised as a man in camp when a, quote, unmistakable twist to the dishcloth and wringing it out that no masculine man could ever successfully counterfeit gave her away. Not all women were discovered in such interesting ways. Most often, they were discharged after medical treatment for a wound that revealed their gender. Becoming pregnant or being killed in action also exposed many others. In reality, it wasn't hard to act as a man in, in the Union or Confederate military. Medical examinations to enlist didn't go very in depth. As long as a soldier had two good eyes and the ability to walk and carry a gun, they were allowed to fight. Without many clothes, the men usually wore the same clothing for weeks on end and only bathed possibly once a week. So bathing and changing were not issues. Some women like Loretta Valetquez practiced to fit in with their masculine comrades. She wore a false mustache and walked with a swagger. It was claimed that once in jail in Lynchburg, Virginia, under suspicion of being a woman, she propped her feet up on a window sill and spat at some passerbys just to convince them that she was not a woman. Women with a strong desire to do something for the cause, but did not wish to dress as men and bear arms, could do something more glamorous and exciting, such as serving as a spy. But women who were in or near the army camps were subject to careful scrutiny and were suspect, particularly if they were there at odd times, unescorted, or acted in any way eccentric. Because ladies were still expected to be treated as ladies, it was very easy for them to move information or even goods through enemy lines. The fashions of the time, such as hoop skirts and hairstyle, made it easy to wrap up letters and maps. These spies risked everything for their cause. 
An acceptable way to serve with the army was as a vivendaire. They accompanied their husband or male relative with the intent of being there to serve as a nurse. Though not in a uniform, they dressed in militaristic fashion. Many of them did carry arms, such as swords. A vivendaire was held in very high esteem by the men as they possessed good moral character. The expanding roles of women during the war period raised self-consciousness and participation in politics, encouraging more women to become involved in the women's rights movement. However, women's rights were eclipsed by the war and emancipation. Women proposed that the fight for freedom be extended to women, but there was little action during this period. The abolition of slavery was the foremost issue in most activist minds. As Lincoln said, this is the hour of the Negro. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were leaders of the women's rights movement. Both women were also active abolitionists. After the war, they produced the publication, The Revolution, which called for equal pay and equal rights and they founded the National Woman Suffrage Association. In 1863, Anthony and Stanton formed the Women's National Loyal League, an organization demanding that the fight for freedom be extended to women as well as African Americans. They fought for the right to vote, equal wages in manufacturing jobs, and the right to work as nurses. The organization paved the way for a more structured association within the women's rights movement. While working as nurses, spies, in the vivendaire, running the family homes, businesses, and plantations, or even doing other despicable things like dressing up as men to join the military, the women of our country achieve more than can be spoken of. Who knows what the women of the future will achieve? For after all, tomorrow is another day. The end.